Okay, um, today I'll be talking about Debus and the Kernel, um, about a project that uh, um, a couple of uh, colleagues and I started called KDBus. Everything is good. Um, uh, precisely, Greg, Daniel, me, Kai, and with some help with, uh, of Tijun. We have so far never spoken about that in public. We have posted a couple of things on the internet, but this is our first talk about this. Um, this talk's going to be fairly um, technical, but then again, we'll probably only uh, touch the, the, the superficial bits of uh, KDBus since uh, there's a lot um, to talk about, and uh, yeah, we cannot go into all the details um, simply as a matter of time. I wouldn't be surprised actually if we don't make it through all the slides anyway, but that's okay. Um, if you have any questions, um, totally interrupt me right away. I'd uh, rather prefer having a discussion constantly going rather than just questions at the end. Um, so yeah, to just show up and interrupt me. I'm totally fine with that, and I welcome you if you do that. Um, okay, um, then let's get to the technical stuff. Um, what's interesting to notice is that uh, um, on Linux, um, we never had, an, had a proper IPC, which is quite in contrast to most uh, new operating system kernels or operating systems that have been designed. And most of them, there was IPC at the beginning, and then everything else was built around um, that IPC. Um, for example, if you look at the Mac kernel, um, like it used by, by MacOS or at QNX or Herd, or actually even Android, they all have a very powerful IPC system in the, in the beginning and then build everything around that. We never had that on, on, on Linux. What we had were IPC primitives. And those primitives were really just what the name says, relatively primitive. They were FIFAs and uh, um, AF Unix sockets, which are basically, I mean, they, there's no concept of message calls or anything like that. They're just streams which is, I guess, the Unix way, but it's also kind of surprising that one can build an operating system out of that. With KDBus, we try to, um, at least we hope, that uh, we can establish an IPC system that is, that is as good as the IPC systems that those operating systems that build everything around it have, and uh, so that we can continue building our operating system around that um, as well. Um, yeah, DBus, at this point, I figure most of you will probably know. Um, DBus is, uh, is basically the most established um, uh, IPC system that we have in Linux. It's uh, quite uh, ubiquitous in, uh, in, in the desktop anyway, and uh, also for system level software. Um, to, to clarify what uh, I mean um, by the word powerful in this case, and that makes it quite distinct from the IPC primitives that Linux has, like FIFAs and sockets and shared memory and things like that. Um, here is a quick rundown of the stuff that Dbus does, um, just in case you don't know Dbus that well or, or I don't know the details. Um, so it is method calls transactions. A method call transaction is basically just you call some method on some other service and you get a reply for it. That's all that, that there is to method call transaction. That's already something that Dbus gives you at the most primitive level. Um, it has signals. Signals is a concept that you can actually send out messages notifying the rest of the system about stuff. Um, then you have uh, properties, which is something like, it's uh, newer um, object-oriented languages um, tend to expose it. It's basically something like a field, like a variable on a property. And um, there's a scheme how you can have these properties, how you can uh, notify others about changes for these properties. Um, all that together makes it a really OO language, like you have objects, objects have interfaces, interfaces have methods, like you would know it from any kind of programming like, language like, like Java, right? Like the, the distinction here to make is that doing Dbus is a lot, actually, like, like programming in a high-level programming language like Java. It uses the same concepts and just exposes um, the generally accepted things that we have in these areas nowadays just on as IPC. Um, for other clients to access. There's broadcasting. Um, it's kind of related to signals. It basically means that uh, you, a process can send out a broadcast signal telling everybody about changes. Um, and that's uh, kind of important in, in, in Divas and, and uh, other clients can then subscribe to these changes. And it's relatively efficiently done in the way that you have matches that you can only get in notifications about a specific subset of these events so that not all processes have to wake up every time something changes. But only the processes that are actually interested in it um, wake up. There's discovery, which is really useful, so you can actually figure out what's actually on the bus, um, like which services, what's available. Um, there's introspection, 
which means like when you know that there is a service, you can actually look into it and it will tell you, okay, I have these objects, I have these, the, my objects have these interfaces, uh, my interfaces have these methods, signals, properties, and so on. Um, it has policy, which is also a very important thing. So um, after all, we're building a, an operating system here which tends to have privileged separation. You have a couple of system level daemons and of un unprivileged user space daemons that run as normal use and they want to access things on those system services, but that needs to be subject to, to policy, right? Like not everybody should be able to ever do anything. For example, um, let's say a network managing service like Network Manager would provide privileged operations to reconfigure the network, but would um, provide unprivileged um, operations to figure out if the machine is connected to a network at all. Right, this kind of policy is built in. There's activation, which is a powerful thing to, to um, make sure that, that uh, the system runs um, with minimal resource usage. Activation basically means that at boot up, you don't have to start all the services that are provided, in, but you can just delay them until they're first used, until they're first requested, until the first massive call or whatever is done to a specific service. There's synchronization, which is um, a more of the ex exotic feature in DBus. Basically, um, um, the way discovery works is, is that you have names there, and these names can actually be used as kind of a mutex thing, that uh, people can acquire a name, and this can be done atomically, and uh, people can can uh, um, like the ownership of the name works a little bit like like mutex securization. There's type safe marshalling. So in contrast to uh, FIFAs, which basically make no requirement at all in what's actually going to be transferred, um, DBAS implies a certain kind of marshalling, so that it's clear. I mean, I'm not sure if the term marshalling is known. It's basically, you could marshalling is the same thing as serialization. It just means that that you find a binary presentation for your um, objects like like integers, um, strings, um, and all these kind of things, structures, arrays, that they have a clear mapping to some binary format that you can actually send over the over the DBAS transport. Um, so it has that. It's kind of powerful and it's uh, type safe. So you actually have a very clear um, the type system that says this is 64-bit unsigned value and this is a string and this is an object pass and these kind of things. Um, there's security. Um, my security in this case, um, what's different from policy here is that you can actually query the identity of everybody on the, on the system. So you actually know the user ID, you know the, the PID of, of a peer that sends you a message and you know the security label, like SU Linux security label. It is monitoring, so you can actually um, uh, connect to the to the IPC system and figure out what's actually going on right now. Like who's sending out messages, who is talking to who, um, who replies with what. Um, I already made this, made this point a bit. It exposes APIs, not just streams, right? It is is much closer to the to the high level API system that a programming language like Java would expose, and much further away from the basic building blocks uh, of streams that are used underneath. Um, passing of credentials, I already mentioned. File descriptor passing, which is a powerful um, technique, um, how you can basically pass resources across security boundaries and these kind of things. Um, it's language agnostic, like everything that, that uh, Dbus does, like all the concepts like interfaces and objects and things like that, are viable from all programming languages, and, and that actually works quite well because Dbus is actually has bindings for almost any programming language there is. It has a certain level of network transparency. That doesn't mean that uh, you wouldn't notice that there was a network. You still have to explicitly use the network transparent mode. But um, you can use Dbus uh, fine across normal sockets, um, like IP sockets, and it will just work. Um, one interesting property is that there's no trust required. So if you, if you have a, you're a client to do a message call into something else, then um, unlike with almost all other IPC systems, there doesn't need to be a, a trust relationship, right? It's, it doesn't have to be the untrusted client and the trusted server, but actually it can be the untrusted client sending something to a completely different untrusted um, a server, and it doesn't have to trust that it does the right thing. It's basically the messages are, are, are self-contained. They will not change underneath um, the receiver. Um, and yeah, it's both ways. Um, completely secure in that way. And because the kernel always adds the identity information in a reliable, unfakeable way, um, they don't have to trust each other. They know that when the kernel identifies one of them, they can trust them. There is a high-level error concept, which is quite interesting um, because, I mean, 
uh, we, we always, like error handling is a messy thing and uh, on, on Linux we traditionally used on the lower level but the, the Arno variables, but they're not very expressive. In Dbus all of that is cleaned up and you have this um, error structure. So yeah, this is just a rough overview. I could probably add a couple of more bullet points there. It's just, just to get an idea why Dbus is useful and why Dbus is better than just writing your own IPC system based on sockets and things like that. So. If Dbus is so great, of course, um, then let's ask, why do we actually need KDBus? So let's have, by, by the way, again, if anybody has any questions, totally interrupt me. Don't, don't hesitate. Um, so what are the limitations of Dbus that we, that we saw and that we wanted to fix? Uh, one thing is it's suitable only for control, not for payload. Um, this basically means with, with, with uh, Dbus you can uh, make method calls um, in, a, in, a, in a great way, but you cannot actually um, include huge amounts of data in it, right? So if you, let's say you want, would, use a sound, would write a sensor with Dbus, so far you could totally issue the control messages to change volume and things like that fine with Dbus, but if you actually wanted to start to, to send the audio samples over Dbus, then you would quickly notice that that's not a good idea. Um, it is also quite inefficient. Right? If you do a full method call transaction with traditional Dbus, you get 10 full method copies, right? message copies. What happens basically is that if a client wants to send a message call to somebody else, it will put together this message, like marshal it into a piece of memory. Then the Dbus library copies that piece of memory into the socket buffer. Then from the socket buffer, um, that's already two copies, right? Like from the da data that the application ate in, into the message and from the message into the socket buffer. From the socket buffer, um, it is copied out into the Dbus daemon. From the Dbus daemon, it's copied out into the next socket buffer that is for the destination socket. And from there into the, 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 the other side that receives it. Those are already five copies. And then for the answer back, you get another five. So all in all, you get 10 memory copies of every message. That must be slow, of course. You get also four, com four complete validations, right? So because, as mentioned, um, it's, a, it's an, a system where, where peers with different privileges exist, every message needs to be validated. It needs to be checked that it's actually in a valid form um, before people go and pass it blindly and, and, and trip up on it. So the way how it currently works in Divas is that there are four complete validations in that transaction. One um, complete validation where basically all the marshalling is, is checked all the way from the beginning of the message to the end is done in the Dbus daemon when it receives it. And then after it's um, sent the message call to the, to the service, um, the service will validate it again. And then again for the message reply, you get another two um, on the way back. So you get four complete validations. You get four context switches. Context switches in the sense that the scheduler will schedule a different process, right? Because if you send something, then you have first, um, your sending process has to switch to Dbus daemon. The Dbus daemon process has to switch to, to um, the receiving side. The receiving side has to switch back to Dbus daemon and Dbus daemon back to the uh, original sender, right? So you have 10 copies, four complete validations, four context switches. That, of course, is not very efficient. Are you going to talk about why you can't optimize that instead of putting everything into the kernel? Well, the way how you can optimize that. Um, if we could rephrase questions before we answer them just so that we pick them up for the live feed then we should okay so the question that was raised is uh, was whether uh, why we cannot just optimize that instead of moving everything into the kernel so my response to that our way of optimizing that is to move it into the kernel right <laughs> um, also we don't move everything into the kernel as you suggest we just move a certain part of it there's a, still a, quite a bit of user space involved but the problem is generally um, there is like the, the basic building blocks that you have on Linux for IPC, FIFOs, sockets, shared memory, um, cannot provide enough that you can get rid of those. Well, but maybe it would be useful to have a zero copy IPC mechanism. Exactly, we have that. It's called KDBus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, what would you suggest? The only zero copy thing you can do is shared memory, but with shared memory, you have always intrinsically the security problems that both sides can access the same memory and can basically um, change the data under, under the, the, the eyes of the other one was the, uh, while the other one is parsing that. It's a, it's, it's a systematic problem with security. You cannot get that work. And the other, other ones you have, like I, I have Unix sockets and FIFOs, you always have to copy things explicitly into them. Um, so yeah, it's not possible with the current um, FIFOs. You, you, you have to add additional code to the kernel if you want to actually make that work with zero copy. Um, the credentials one can send and receive over Dbus are are limited. 
right? There's UID PID and GID. Well, actually, the GID is not even exposed. And there's a security label, but that's about it. Um, sometimes uh, one would want uh, quite a bit more. What those are, we will see a little bit later. There's no implicit timestamping, which is sometimes uh, problematic when if you want to, if you get messages from quite a few um, uh, other peers, um, timestamping is essential so that, so that you can order them and, and know what came before what. Um, there is, um, DBoost is something that is only viable in late boot, right? If you, if you, if you um, build operating systems like we always do, we always have this problem, yeah, if we are in early boot, if we are in init RD, if we are during shutdown, we cannot use um, DBoost IPC because it's simply not available because the daemon is not running. And it's really, really difficult to pull it in, in front because you always have the security, like, like for the init RD, you have to replace it. And the other problem is that then activation, the way current DBus daemon does it, would activate the services way too early. Um, and yeah, so it's a, it's a problem for us basically that it's not universal, that it's only something that's very late during boot. And that's a problematic thing if you wanna have an IPC that every component can use, um, even if it's, I don't know, a storage manager running an early boot. Um, the hookup with security framework happens in user space. I mean, I personally don't really care too much about those security frameworks. Those security frameworks are SA Linux, up ARM, and these kind of things. But the security people always dislike the fact that if DBus security, like, like um, uh, policy decisions are made and those are hooked up to the SA Linux policy, the upper ARM policy, then the decision about that needs to take um, place in user space. And the kernel people would usually, like the security people, would always prefer it if all these decisions can happen in one place in the kernel so that they don't have to trust user space. Um, then there's the other uncleanliness, at least the way I see it in my, in my biased view, is that um, DBus activated services so far were completely different beast <laughs> than, than the other um, services that run on system like traditional system five in its scripts, uh, in its script services, right? The, the traditional system five in its scripts would be forked at boot time and then would just stay running and their environment would have to be set up manually and via the shell script, but in, um, in the in the DBus activated case, you get you get basically the execution environment set up by DBus daemon, right? And uh, from our perspective, we think that regardless how you talk to other daemons and how you're activated, if you activate via sockets via bus names and kind of things, you should probably run the same same execution environment. Um, yeah, um, the, another. Um, uh, uh, um, issue that many people at least see with uh, DBus Daemon is that the code base is a little bit baroque. It's a little bit, let's say, over-designed. It uh, it's very object-oriented and a little bit over the top, like you have a couple of layers of transports and, and, and things on top. Um, the fact is nobody likes to use the classic um, uh, DBus library. They use a lot of XML, like for example, um, the policy is, is uh, expressed in, in, in XML and it's really awful. Um, the, the XML is used for, for introspection, these kind of things. Uh, some of these XML users are probably okay, but especially the XML policy is something that nobody ever got, uh, got right. And we had it quite often in the generic distributions that some package um, mocked around with the um, policy and resulted in some other package um, security hole because they opened too much um, of the traffic. So, um, yeah. And this is a like a small one here I added at the end. What what's really uh, not nice is if you if you talk about activation of services, then then which basically is mostly focusing on that they get started when they're needed. Then the other side of the medal is usually that you want to terminate them when they're not needed anymore. And you cannot secure so like safely without losing any 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 traffic. Do that with classic divas because. Basically, when you decide I'm idle now, you try to disconnect from DBus, but all the messages that are then still in the queue that you have not read will be lost. Um, I'm not going to go into much more details, except that it's horribly racy in current DBus and practically not possible. Um, yeah, we would like to fix that too. Um, there are a couple of more things that, that's problematic with DBus, but these are the, the, the ma major ones. Um, I think that the top two are, are, are the primary drivers for what we did there. So, even those, given those limitations, let's underline that DBus is actually fantastic and it solves real issues, right? We believe it's, it, the concepts that it introduces um, of services, of, of objects, methods, um, signals, and all these kind of things are absolutely well designed and are the, the things that we believe make a lot of sense. I mean, DBus was designed 10 years ago, right? And by now we do 
know from having worked with it for 10 years is that, or I, I don't actually know if it's actually 10 years, but it feels like it was 10 years. It's actually 10 years? Um, uh, so it feels like we, we nowadays know that Sure, it might have shortcomings, but the shortcomings are not in the general concept. The shortcomings are in performance and the other things that I just pointed out. So it's quite comprehensive. It covers everything, right? We build an init system with it. We build a desktop environment with it. Um, people build in the cars and these kind of things. It covers pretty much everything. It's, it's not like a specific solution, like, for example, the Android binder is, which is optimized for ARM CPUs and these kind of things. It's a solution that really covers all the grounds, um, basically, what, what uh, Linux covers as well. It's also quite established, right? It's a single most used local high-level IPC system in Linux, and it has bindings for most languages. I mean, people have come up with quite a few different local IPC systems, like Corber and, and what's, what, what on DCOP. But at this point in time, I think it's absolutely safe to say that on Linux, at least on traditional Linux, if you look at Android, of course, Android Binder is more established. But um, on traditional Linux, um, there is pretty much nothing else but DBus that people um, generally use. Um, as mentioned, it covers like it, it has found its uses all the way from the system to desktop and so on. Okay, so yeah, I hope at this point you have an understanding why we believe that Dbus is the conception of the right thing, but has certain shortcomings. And uh, we'll come to KDBus now to explain you what we do better, or at least believe that we do better than uh, a traditional Dbus. Any questions up to this point? You guys need to ask more questions. Um, okay, so KDBus, from the beginning, is it's suitable for large data, large data, right? You can send gigabytes of, of, of memory over it. It supports zero copy, even though it will not do zero copy by default. Why? We will tell you later. Um, this memory that you, like these large di data blobs, are nothing that you, you have to send once and then cannot reuse. There's actually an entire concept built in that you can um, actually, for example, send the same memory, like an image, a couple of times, and that's highly efficient. It's anyway totally efficient because uh, you remember that slide where I said 10, 4, and 4? For us, it's two or fewer copies, right? For zero copy, it's zero copies, and for in the normal case, it's actually two copies. There are two validations and two contact switches, right? Again, this is for a, f uh, a full duplex method call. There's a typo, method call transaction, um, which basically means, yeah, you make a call, that is one copy, and you get the reply back, and that's another copy. And because every peer needs to validate the message from the other side because it can be trusted, you have those two validations, and you have two context switches because you first switch to the other side, and then you switch back. So it's pretty much near to, to how few you can actually make there. So the validation is done by the receiver. Right. So so um, this is, goes a little bit further into what we're talking about later, but um, uh, so, so basically um, the, the design that we picked there is that the kernel only has a very superficial idea of the marshalling. It will only know the, the basic, the, the outside routing, right? It knows, it knows where the message need to, needs to go and where it's from. It does not know anything about the contents. It doesn't know anything about what array you attach to it or variant you attach to it, and it shouldn't know that, right? The kernel, that's, that's a nice um, design. Uh, <coughs> feature. Um, okay, so the credentials that are sent along are comprehensive, right? There's everything in it. You can have UID, PID, and GIT like you can have traditionally in SL Linux labels, but you can also have the PID start time. PID start time is, is actually kind of useful because if you combine it with a PID, it kind of solves the problem that PIDs are reused, so you can actually use that for, for security purposes. There's a TID. The TID is a thread ID on Linux. There's a COM field. That's a process name as you see it in in the uh, top. Uh, there's a tidcom, which is a threat um, name. There's argv, like, which is like the command line. There's exa, which is the path to the binary and C groups and caps and audits. Um, we added all of these. Some of them are, are highly useful for security purposes. Like, for example, the audit stuff is something the audit people wanted um, forever because then they actually can, can um, log audit information on every single method call. But um, our personal reason why we personally wanted that is that we want to build uh, the journal's log client based on this because then we can, in a race-free fashion, get the identity of the sender and log that away so that every message is stored with, with information about um, these kind of things. But this is, this is also a lot very useful for, for things like policy kit because um, from the C group you can identify the session that something comes from and see these kind of things. Um, so yeah, it has quite a few uses. 
So it's implicit uh, timestamping. Whenever a message is sent, the timestamp is taken. It works a little bit like timestamping works in network packages, uh, packets these days. Um, and you can query them. Uh, there's actually um, like there are two timestamps always taken, the monotonic and the real-time clock. So, so that would be useful for um, a lot of purposes. Um, it's always available from earliest boot to latest shutdown. It's uh, basically our client side, we'll come to that later, is built into systemd, and systemd will set it up really, really early on. So basically, um, the only time that the system exists without this IPC working is this really short time where systemd has not sh started any process yet. Um, yeah, so effectively this means IPC is for the first time available from all the way that user space exists to all the end that it stops to exist. Um, because it's implemented in the kernel, it's, it's open for LSMs to hook into, the, into that from the kernel side. Um, the activation that we did with KDBus tries to copy concepts that we have with socket activation. So um, with this DBus services stop to be special regarding activation there. You can basically have a service that is socket activatable, bus activatable, hardware activatable, and whatnot activatable, and everything's handled the same way and executed in the same um, uh, execution environment, and your service doesn't have to care how it got activated. Um, it just knows that some reason was there, and it can actually figure out which one that is, if it, it cares about that, um, uh, to, to be started. The user space is much simpler. Um, and there's no XML anymore. Well, there's some XML for the introspection stuff. We couldn't get rid of that. But for the policy, at least, um, that's gone. Um, and yeah, this other little thing, um, you can do race-free exit on idle for bus activated services, which is something I personally care about. Um, there's probably a couple of more of these. Yeah, so that's a high-level overview why. Now let's, unless there are any further questions, you guys need to ask more questions. Um, there's a question. So the, the, the names um, is a difficult question because some people... Hmm? Uh, so, so the question was re regarding, uh, if I understood correctly, whether Dbus is going to be a shim around KDBus. I think there's a question about uh, naming things. For us, Dbus is just a, a, a concept, like a generic concept of IPC, and, and KDBus is pretty much compatible to that, right? It's just a re-implementation of it. There are some changes if you connect via KDBus instead of via the, the old one, like you have to care for a different policy. We will come to that. But basically, I assume that, that, a, that a system in for one year or so will basically use KDBus for everything. Um, the clients will talk directly to KDBus. And if, if, uh, um, if there are legacy programs, like statically linked binaries and things like that, then they will connect via some proxy, which we will also um, still come to. Um, to connect to traditional KDBus. But basically, uh, it's going to be KDBus and that allows. So the expectation is if I have a Python application today that uses the DBus bindings, then this is going to be dropped in and I'm not going to have to change anything about the application? Yes. So the question was regarding whether you have a Python binary, uh, if you don't have to change anything, if you just want to keep it running on KDBus. Yes, you do not have to change anything. I mean, there are some, yeah, basically you have to not to change anything. There, there are very limited differences. Um, like regarding, like regarding the policy, but you can even ignore that. Um, but regarding timing, and that sometimes you might be f uh, capable of figuring out that you're not running on a real Divas daemon, but on a fake one. But those are niche cases, and uh, I'll bet you f $50 that you're not going to find that. <laughs> <laughs> No, we don't. Um, so, I mean, uh, we, we, the, the, the state is, well, uh, let's talk about it later, but we don't. Um, anyway, <laughs> any further? Qu that's a question. Uh, those advantages that you just listed, do they rely on KDBus being tied into systemd? Um, well, I mean, our user space, the user space that we wrote, is built into systemd. But um, people can write other uh, uh, um, uh, user spaces. There's no problem <coughs> in that. Like, the stuff is completely generic. There's no, I mean, the, the, there's no requirement from the kernel at the user space side of systemd that would be crazy. But um, uh, our code is bound to systemd, and it involves a lot of concepts um, that are systemd concepts. For example, activation is implemented as a unit, 
which in the unit is a systemd concept. So um, I don't know. We, we will not work on anything outside of systemd. If people want, they can certainly do that. Um, everything's documented, like, or at least roughly documented. I mean, it's right to the new stuff, so all it, you might ha need to ask us in, in some cases. But um, people can write that. You can probably even salvage some of our code and make that work. But I'm pretty sure if you want to use it outside of systemd, you have to do your own work first. But, uh, some of the advantages you talk about, like not using XML configuration files, are they systemd advantages working with KD bus, or are they KD bus advantages? Well, again, this is this is. The entire user space that we wrote is, is, is inside of systemd. And that user space does not use XML for the policy anymore. Um, I, I don't see why you would want to use, even if in a different user space implementation, I don't see why you would want to use XML for that configuration bits. In particular, because the policy is one of the few cases where, where, where we are quite different from the original um, DBus design, because the original XML policy language was so badly designed that we wanted to get rid of it. Any further questions at that point? Okay, no. Just repeat the question when you're giving the answer. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, was that clear? Do I need to repeat the other one? Okay, so about the, the, the technical details now. Um, this is going to get quite uh, um, uh, technical now. The way how this all works is basically um, KDBus is, is um, by design, it's a character device that you find in, in, in slash dev. So it's, it's, it feels a little bit like a device driver. You open that thing, and then um, you basically get a file descriptor out of it, and you can take that file descriptor and memory map it. When you memory map it, you basically uh, just set up a, a memory arena where the kernel will then drop the messages that are attended for you into. And then the kernel will tell you where it placed it, and then you can read it from there. Right? So um, every receiver has its own buffer set up like that. And when you send a message, what happens is basically you just tells, tell the kernel, OK, copy the message that I have prepared here in this my private area into the receiver buffer of that other peer. And then the kernel does that, and that's it. That's, it. And that's basically the entire design of, of, of how we do these transactions. That's why we can do single copy um, um, uh, uh, message uh, transfer. Because we, we don't need to copy something into the socket buffer and then out of the socket buffer into the destination. All we do is we tell the kernel, OK, copy this bit directly into the receiver buffer on the other side. Um, these receiver buffers, because they're actually tied to the file descriptor that you have, you can actually pass a file descriptor around and have 10 people memory map the same buffer, and they can access the, the messages they receive with that. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, this is single copy to disk destinations. This is for the case where you have a small message you want to give it to somebody. Um, there's a concept called method called Windows. Um, a message called window, it's a time window, basically, where if you send a message to somebody else, where that somebody else is allowed to send back a message to you. And um, uh, yeah, so it's basically, it opens a hole in the, in the policy so that um, you can send one message back for every message call that somebody made so that you can send a reply back. Um, this, this window um, also has a couple of other implications. For example, there's a timeout attached to it. So if the other side doesn't decide not to send a reply back, you get a information from the kernel that this timed out, then the window will be closed, and you can generate know that the thing timed out, the other side didn't respond. Um, so yeah, there's a name registry. The name registry is very close to how the traditional Dbus <coughs> name registry worked. Like name registry uh, is about service names here. So basically, that Avahi gets the name "Hello, I'm Avahi," and a network manager gets the name, hello, I'm, I'm network manager, and then the kernel keeps a list of that. And um, it's what the kernel does here in KDBus is actually very, very close to how the, um, the traditional method worked, um, like the traditional implementation in DBus Demon worked. However, it's a bit more powerful, like a couple of new concepts like activators and things like that. But um, we'll not go into the detail um, for that because we, I don't have the time, and B, that you probably only need to know about these if you actually implement a user space. Um, uh, a second user space implementation of all of that. Um, another concept that we introduced is MemFDs, right? MemFDs are for, I mean, we, we just talked about the receiver buffers of the single copy data transfer. MemFDs is a concept that we use for the zero copy uh, transfer. A MemFD is a very simple concept. It is just a file descriptor on a piece of memory, right? Um, it's basically similar to opening a file in slash temp, immediately deleting it, and mapping it into memory, but keeping the file descriptor open. 
And then you can send somebody else a file descriptor, and he can manage, uh, map as well and look into the same data. And as soon as oh, everybody closed the file descriptor and unmapped the memory, it's gone. Um, MAMFDs are a lot like that, but also very different. They are different um, in, the, in, the, in this particular feature that they, are, um, they support something called ceiling. The ceiling is basically that you, if there's only one file descriptor open for one of these MAMFDs, and nobody has mapped it, then it can be sealed, which basically means that nobody can uh, change it anymore until it's unsealed. The reason why we have that is, is basically that if you, if you prepare some, some large message, like sample data or video data or whatnot, wanted to send to, to somebody, then both sides need a bit of assurance, right? The sender needs to be sure that the, that the receiver cannot change it, because, I mean, if you would do it with the temp file thing, he could. Um, and the receiver needs to be sure that the sender cannot send it anymore until uh, after it's sent it, right? Because both of them have to parse the data or, or reuse the data, and they need to make sure that the other side cannot um, change things underneath, confusing the part that you have. That's, a, that's quite a security fe feature. Um, what's interesting, uh, so we use this basically in, in uh, KDBus, these MAMFDs, um, partially in a completely transparent way that the client will never actually know that MAMFDs are um, used on a niche. Um, so what, what happens actually, if you build a message with, with uh, a KDBS client library, what happens is that all the message data is actually first put together in a MAMFD, right? Then when we figure out that the MAMFD is full over a certain threshold, we will seal that MAMFD and send the MAMFD over to the other side instead of the actual message itself. However, if the message stays under that threshold, we will copy the message directly, right? That's a distinction between zero copy and, and, and a single copy here. If it's small, we do single copy. If it's large, we do zero copy. The interesting thing that we figured out is that um, the threshold actually needs to be at 512 kilobytes, where zero copy is faster than single copy. Before that, single copy is faster than zero copy, actually. The reason for that, which, I mean, sounds surprising that doing one copy is cheaper than doing zero copies. Um, the reason for that is simply to do that zero copy stuff, you actually need to map it on the other side. Now, mapping files is, is while after you map the access is quick, actually the mapping part of it is expensive because it flushes TLDs and these kind of things. So um, we actually ran a couple of tests on a couple of different CPUs to figure out when is it slower to um, set up a memory region, map it first, then put the data in it, close it, um, like seal it, send it over, open it again, and map it. When is that operation slower, which involves two memory maps and two memory unmaps, then, or as lo how long is that slower um, than simply copying the data over directly without any mapping involved? As it turns out, in pretty much all CPUs that we tried, like from Intel CPUs to PPC and, and even ARM or something, um, it always ended up to be around 512K, where the, the, the simple copy to the other side is quicker than, than than actually passing those MAMFDs around. So again, putting this together, what happens actually is like we, like the sender always puts stuff together in, in a MAMFD. When it figures out at the end when the message is fully um, put together, that this is under a certain threshold, it will just copy the bits, right? Like if it's, if it's under 512K, it will just copy it directly into the receiver by further kernel. Um, however, if it's larger than that, it will instead um, just send a tiny um, uh, stub of a message and say, okay, the actual payload of this message you find in that MAMFD. And then the other side mam uh, maps that. Now, this concept is mostly hidden in the library. You never know that what, what's actually sent there, and it's not relevant to the applications because we actually do the fastest thing uh, for you anyway and, and blindly. However, the MAMFDs are also exposed in the API so that applications can make direct use of these because um, uh, for a certain use case, it makes sense to to reuse MAMFDs, right? For example, if you, I mean, I, I wrote Pulse Audio, as you might know, and in, in Pulse Audio, we have a sample cache, right? Like if you have, for those click sounds, we, we keep the, the, the click sound in a buffer, and uh, then every time you click, instead of loading this thing again and then again and again and again, we put in a sample um, cache and just play the same memory again and again and again. This actually maps nicely to the MAMFD stuff, because basically, yeah, you just load the sample, put it in the MAMFD, seal it, and then every time it's, it, it's uh, um, played, you just pass that file descriptor to the, to the actual daemon, and that's it, right? And because, both of the, because of the ceiling, it's completely okay. Now we can change anything, and it's safe and secure. <coughs> um, 
the, co the, the concept of MemFD is not unlike something called Android AshMem. AshMem is something that Android people, um, I mean, it's, it's not part of Android Binder, but they usually use it close to that. Um, it's, it's, uh, AshMem is nothing that is implicitly used by Binder or the client libraries. It's something that is explicitly used by applications. AshMem is very similar again. It does not support the same concept of sealing. For AshMem, only one side has to tr uh, trust the other side, and the other side like, um, uh, can be sure that the other one can change. So it's a one-way trust relationship, um, while for us, there doesn't need to be any trust. Um, and it has a couple of other concepts, like, like that you can destroy it and things like that. But we'll probably get that on the Linux kernel with volatile ranges and, and whatnot. So that's a completely different story. So yeah, um, if you look at Android Ashman, it's a very similar thing. But uh, our MMFDs um, are different. Ooh. Um, Well, I mean, the, 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 everything that uh, MKDBus does, uh, the question was um, with, uh, with unswappable memory and the sealed messages. So that's not really a problem because uh, everything that uh, um, KDBus does, regardless if it's a receiver buffer or these MemFD things, is actually backed by TempFS. So it is a swappable memory always. So um, yeah, it's basically like having a file in, in slash temp. It's very, very close to that. It's memory of the, of the process, not of the kernel. So um, I don't have that much time anymore, so let's quickly glance over signal broadcasting because it's technically kind of cool. Um, I already mentioned that, that on, on Dbus you have, um, you have these broadcasts that you can send a signal to everybody and then everybody um, like can have specific filters on that and can only be notified and only delivered those messages that he, um, it is actually interested in. We implemented that in KDBus with something called Bloom filters. Bloom filters is something it's used quite frequently, like for example, the, the, the Glipsy dynamic loader uses this technology to, like this, 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 this idea, to um, uh, speed up symbol lookup in, 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 in libraries. So what it basically does, well, and Google uses it for example, if you type something into the Google search mask, it will check against a Bloom filter if that um, query has any chance to actually succeed. What a Bloom filter does basically, it is, you it's, it's a piece of memory that you calculate from a big vocabulary. And, um, and it involves hash uh, functions, basically. And then later on, you can test one word against this um, Bloom filter, and it will tell you um, probabilistically that it's either um, in, inside of the Bloom filter, which means probably, if you actually now go to the disk, you will find it, or it will say, no, it's not in there. So the not is not probabilistic, the yes is probabilistic. I hope you guys could follow. If you want to know the details about Bloom filters, um, actually read, read up on, on Wikipedia or something. Um, Bloom filters have been used before in Libudev for the notification, because in, in Libudev you have the case that different apps are interested in different parts of, 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 of uh, devices showing up. And uh, so we already used it like, like five years ago, we added that to Libudev. So basically, every message comes with a Bloom filter where the, the vocabulary used is every possible match that clients might have on that uh, message. And then the message, um, then the, the receiver just um, installs a mask that needs to be tested against that Bloom filter. Um, it's, it's really nice um, stuff, actually. So for broadcast messages, we we always attach a Bloom filter, and then the, the receiver side is calculated Bloom filter mask, and then tell the kernel about it. For the kernel, doesn't know much about Bloom filters. And for the kernel, it's just a, a field of bits, basically, that it needs to, to mask against, but user space and it can make more sense out of it. So yeah, um, I think I'll skip the policy part. Um, the user space side, as mentioned, um, lives mostly in systemd. There are a couple of um, components involved. Um, there is a proxy. The proxy um, basically provides compatibility with the old socket-based interface. Everything the proxy does is for, for like, the, you have a couple of instances usually running of that, and it will listen on the traditional socket, um, like va, lib, dbus, system socket bus or something like that as a so um, socket call. And um, every message coming, coming in will be forwarded to KDBus. And then KDBus responses will be forwarded to the client so that the client doesn't have to know that, that KDBus is involved. And will, it appears to, KD, uh, to the, those clients basically that talk to a traditional um, DBus daemon. It's, it's only exists for compatibility and it's probably going to go away soon.
Okay, so the question was, if you don't recompile your stuff against traditional leap debugs, whether, the o, the, whether kdbus is used or the, the proxy is used, the answer to that is that currently there is no, no uh, port of libdebus uh, to KDB, so it will always go via the proxy. Um, however, there are people from uh, Samsung working on, on making traditional libdebus work on KDBus on top. And then, of course, the logic is going to be, um, yeah, KDBus is uh, preferred and the sockets are only the fallback. But uh, there are some differences, like, like I said, some issues with that involving policy because our policy is different. And um, for the session, that's what's going to happen because in the session there is no policy, but for the system it's a little bit more complex. But given that I don't have much time, I'll yeah. Um. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, given that I have one minute, let's finish off with one slide. I mean, again, it's not a problem that I, I did not expect to make all these slides. It's, it's a lot of uh, ground to cover. Uh, a, a lot of ground to cover. Um, but uh, uh, I hope at least you, you got the ideas of, of the, the concept of the bloom filters a bit and, and of, the, of the MemFDs and of the, the receiver buffers. Um, so let's finish with one slide regarding the when. Um, we have been hacking about, uh, on this um, for the last month. And uh, we have announced like, the first um, working system, like, like work, working implementation of all of this um, a couple of weeks ago on the Dbus mailing list. If you want to know all the details, just look up on the Dbus mailing list and, and you'll find a longer text that covers a lot more ground than I was just telling you about here. Probably takes a little bit longer to go through than just 45 minutes. Um, the code's all there. It's pretty much completely implemented. The, the only white space still missing is basically um, a policy. Um, the good thing about policy is that while all the other features make, features make things work, Policy is usually just about making things not work. So um, you can totally boot up a system without policy and everything will work. Of course, it will be horribly insecure, but who cares about security anyway, right? <laughs> um, yeah, the policy is still the white space. We are working on that. I have on my machine, on this one, actually, I have already most of the client side working. And uh, we figured out most of the kernel side as well. Um, it's a compile time search and system D to make use of this. Um, uh, um, so the, the reason why it's a compile time switch is simply because we don't want clients to assume that KDB the way it is currently will work in, in five years because we want the freedom to change it still. We hope that the kernel side is going to be reviewed and accepted to kernel in 2014, like in a, in a current year. Um, given that Greg is involved and that we managed to get to June on board for, for, for reviewing everything, we kind of hope that it's going to be relatively smooth right. Then again, two previous attempts to get DBus into the kernel already failed. Um, but uh, we, are, we are hoping the best. Uh, yeah, GDBus support is, is, is being worked on, like in, in GLib. Um, as mentioned, some of the people have been working on libdbus1. I didn't put the URLs for the Git repos here because you can Google for them. And uh, that's all I have. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>